Hey, what's up guys? This is Nick from Nick Expose. On this episode, we're gonna go into another question and answer episode. We haven't done one of these since like last fall? I don't know, whenever the last time we did one is. It's been a while, so I'm super pumped. We got eight different questions that I got in from you guys. Uh, I put the call out earlier this week onto Patreon and then uh, followed up with a call this morning out to Instagram and we have some really, really thoughtful questions in here that I think are really gonna bring us into uh, some great directions. So I also put a poll out earlier today, so I was letting the hair breathe this morning and uh, put a poll out on Instagram to see whether you guys thought I should wear it up or wear it down, and we had pretty much a resounding yes to wearing it down. So uh, we're gonna go as far as I can. The AC's off, so that way my mic doesn't pick up any noise, so I might have to put it up after a couple questions here. Fun fact is I always get uh, comments of like, oh, film Jesus when I wear my hair down, but fun fact is I've actually played Jesus three times in the Easter production at my church. Fun fact for you guys today. <laughs> All right, we're just going to go into the questions. First question. Patron Jason Brewer asks, if you were to start over from nothing, had a shoestring budget, and wanted to shoot film, what would you recommend someone buy for a camera, lens, and film stock? The big thing I would say is don't worry about equipment. Just get into film however you can. So back in 2016, actually 95% of my work was shot on this. Uh, this is just a Minolta point-and-shoot camera that I got at a thrift store for $2. Um, this does have the 35mm 2.8 lens. If you can find something like this with the 2.8 or the 3.5 or uh, anything around that level, um, it's a great way to go. But just finding any old lens. I've been watching some guys create amazing, amazing work with like the plastic lens, like, you know, rewind lever or knob thing that like tears your finger up, uh, point and shoots that they found at thrift stores too. The gear doesn't matter. So find whatever you can within your budget. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll link to it up top here, but way back at the beginning of the channel, I did a two-part series on thrift store shopping for film cameras. So uh, if you wanna find out any more information on thrift store shopping for cameras like this, go check that out. But just find something within your budget and then just find whatever film. I would say HP5 is a great place to start with black and white uh, or Tri-X, depending on whichever you could get cheaper within your region. Um, or if you wanna do color, Kodak Gold or Kodak Max or Fuji Superior. Anything and everything that you can find for dirt cheap uh, is, is a good way to start. I mean, don't worry about the, the actual equipment and everything like that. Just get out there and shoot and make photos that you're proud of. Uh, and then a real quick tip before we move on to the next question is also leverage your friends and family. Like, put a call out to your Facebook and say, hey, anybody in the area have any old film cameras or any old film just lying around in your drawer or anything like that uh, that you'd be willing to give away? You'd be surprised. I've gotten film cameras from my aunts and uncles, from my grandparents, from friends, everybody. As soon as they found out that I was shooting film, they're just bringing cameras to me and going, hey, I don't know if you could use this, but people have this stuff lying around. Just put it out there and see if anybody wants to, uh, to just give you some and let you play around with it that way. So that's, I mean, if you're on a shoestring budget, what better way to go about it than free? Uh, but that's a good way to, uh, to get started into film or to just simplify your setup and, uh, and just roll that way. Our next question comes from another patron supporter is Fee. She asks, after a year off of the real world, I'm really nervous about getting back out and stop being creative. I can't stop, otherwise I would go insane, but I do need to get a nine to five job and I'm really afraid of just getting stuck in that. Top tip for not getting lost in reality. Uh, I absolutely love this question because I think it, it really applies to people on all different levels. Someone that's just getting out of college, which I know is Fee's case, so she says a year off of the real world, she's been in uh, New York going to the ICP Institute out there. But at the same time, I think that this is a great question for anybody who is in a nine to five job right now uh, and is just trying to work through of how do I stay creative even though I have to work all week long. Um, so the big thing that I would say, and I actually, uh, not to always link to these videos, but I'll link to another video that I did a while back. It was a two minute Tuesday about scheduling our creativity and blocking off time to make sure that we're uh, remaining creative. And I, I think that this is one of the biggest, biggest things that I've done for myself over the last few years, back in 2015 and then especially 2016, is I started 
treating my photography as if it were a part-time job or even just a secondary job altogether. So I'd say if you're, if you're working like Monday through Friday, then make sure on the weekends you're chalking off time to go out and be creative or even in the evenings. Uh, right now we're in the summertime or going into the summertime, so the sun is up super late. So uh, when I get out of work at 5 o'clock, I could still dart out and do a lot of street shooting downtown between 6 o'clock and, and 9 o'clock when the sun's going down or even 9.30 later on in the summertime. So I still got three hours that I could really hone into my craft. Um, even if you don't have that, or if you work a, a weird schedule that throws you off, you could start chalking off your weekends and then using the time to where you're, you know, tired after work to develop film, to scan film, and to do more of the monotonous stuff of our film photography. But really making sure that uh, we're out there creating. Another thing is Emily and I really don't watch YouTube and, and uh, Netflix that much. We're just really uh, focusing on pushing each other creatively. Obviously, we'll, we'll put it on in the background. I do love watching YouTube videos, but it will only be on in the background when I'm scanning film or when I'm developing film or when I'm doing things that don't require my focus uh, of really diving into creativity. But I'm not gonna come home and veg on the couch all afternoon because I wanna get out there and I wanna make it a priority within my schedule. So number one tip, pro tip, I guess, <laughs> if you wanna call it that, is really making sure that you're giving yourself the responsibility of going out and creating more work and, and making your zines and making your different projects and putting in the, the exhibition calls and the open calls and the whatever it is, but making sure that you chalk off time in your schedule and you honor that time as if it were a job. If I'm gonna treat it like a job, then I need to be my own manager and I need to hold myself responsible for getting out there and creating. I do the same thing with these YouTube videos. And actually, to be honest with you, I've been a little bit more lazy with the YouTube videos because I've been under the weather and different things like that, but I need to get back to the place where I'm holding myself responsible and going, did I get my videos out this week that I wanted to get out this week or that I needed to get out this week or that I promised to get out this week? And, uh, and just hold yourself accountable. So that's the big thing is chalking off time, making it a priority in your schedule and treating it as if it were a part-time job uh, because if you don't treat it as a job right now, it will never become a job in the future. It's just kind of the reality of how things go. So, Fee, thank you so much for that question. I hope that uh, that serves not only you, but anybody else in the 9 to 5 position. Next question comes from Jared. He says, hey, Nick, love the videos. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I was wondering, what do you think is the most common misconception about photography? I was thinking about this beforehand, and I, I wanted to really have a good answer for this, but the only thing that I could really come up with is that photography isn't about photography at all. Uh, photography is about photography only as much as learning the equipment and learning the, the tricks of the trade to be able to accomplish the photos that you want to accomplish. So I'd say the biggest misconception is people make photography all about photography, but photography is all about life. Uh, it's all about the thing that you're actually you know, recognizing in life and perceiving in life and perceiving in reality and then capturing that, capturing the emotion of it, capturing the story of it, capturing whatever it is that's in front of the camera. Photography is always about the stuff that's in front of the camera and then the thought process behind the camera. The camera is just the bridge between those two things. Ooh. Ooh, I don't think I've ever said that before, but I really like that. Um, <laughs> I'm in a really weird mood right now. But yes, the camera is the bridge between the thing that's in front of the camera and the thing that's behind the camera, being your head, being your thought process, being the way that you perceive things. But I would say that in my mind, that's the biggest misconception within photography. So Robert asks, any advice in focusing a Leica in very low light? All right, so here's the deal with not only just a Leica or, or film cameras in general, but any camera. When you're focusing in low light situations, you wanna find good contrast patches. Um, so if somebody is in complete shadow here, but you're trying to photograph them and they just have this highlight of a, a edge of light on them, that's where you want to put your focusing patch and that's where you want to try and line up, especially you know, if you're shooting a Leica or other rangefinder, you got your focusing patch that goes back and forth. You want to find a point to where you could actually see where you can line it up. Um, if you're shooting autofocus, so when Emily and I were doing weddings and um, different things like that, different paid gigs, and we're using the 5D, we put that point not on the eye, but on the thing that's closest to the plane as the eye, but has that, that light. 
And if I'm far enough away to where, you know, I'm taking more of an environmental portrait, the further you get away from your subject, the further the depth of field is that you have to work with. So you might be able to get the front of the face in focus if you're focusing even on the back rim light of a head if you're far enough away. So I would say you might have to dodge and weave and duck and dive to be able to put your focusing patch in and get them into a position to where they're being backlit or they're getting a, a rim light or you're moving around them to where they actually had a light back here, but you were trying to focus up here. So you move around them to where you could get that focusing point on. But it's always, always, always about finding wherever the contrast point is on the person or the thing. It might not be a person. It might be a thing that you're shooting. One of the things that I like to do, especially when when I was shooting like uh, dancing shots for weddings, is I like to get down low. And I, I would place myself low and shoot up towards them because I could put them against this, the light on the ceiling. Um, and if it's a concert scene or if it's anything else, uh, you know, obviously there's typically lights up top. You can put yourself low and, and have there be a contrast. One, it gives for interesting images anyway because you're adding natural contrast to a scene. But then two, it gives you a better place to be able to find that focusing patch uh, to, to focus on. So whether you're shooting a range fighter, or whether you're shooting uh, actual, you know, SLR, or you're shooting something with a, a DSLR, like autofocus, just finding those contrast points is crucial to being able to actually focus on things or people or anything like that in low light. So, um, Robert, I hope that answers your question, and I hope that uh, answers anybody else out there that might have uh, some difficulty with focusing in low light. Next question comes from Jeff. He says, what do you feel as a photographer has been your impact within the world? Jeff, I love this question because it kind of caused me to, to actually think back and go, what have I done with my photography? And um, that's just an encouraging thing. So I, I challenge everyone who's watching this video to go back and think, what is it that I'm actually serving the world with my photography on? Um, I would say two things. First of all is I think my videos are probably the biggest impact that I have for the world. And I just love, love, love serving other photographers and helping to engage with other photographers and, and pull people up to whatever successes I may have had, um, but then also allow others to learn from my mistakes. Uh, and then the other thing is, I think as photographers, we just have a, an artist in general, we just have a unique position of being able to offer ourselves vulnerably uh, and intimately through our artwork and through our craft. That's one of the things I love about photography and love about art in general is, you know, when I shoot something, when I perceive something, when I put it on paper and I'll offer a print to the world or when I put it up on Instagram, I'm offering a bit of myself and there's a conversation that happens uh, in that whole thing to where all of a sudden now I've put myself in a vulnerable place for someone else to be able to approach me and then I get to know them even more. And I, I just think that relationships is one of the greatest things that I've at least experienced and hopefully that I've offered to the world um, through my photography and then even through these videos. It, it's another expression of that very thing. So um, I don't know if that's as deep of an answer as you were hoping for, Jeff, but uh, as I was thinking about it, that's just kind of what comes to mind. And uh, and I really do like that question. I'm probably going to think even more on it as we go. Eric says, hey, Nick, I have a question for your Q&A. It's about asking for feedback on my work. I'm trying to improve and consider the opinion and feedback of other photographers very valuable. But who do I ask for feedback? A photographer I already know, someone who has uh, shown some interest in my work, or a photographer that I admire? And how important do you feel that feedback is or feedback of others is? Uh, so there's multiple different questions here, so I'll, I'll kind of work it in tiers. What Eric was saying is, I want feedback. Who do I go to, to for feedback? And is feedback valuable, do you think? So first of all, is uh, wanting feedback is a very, very uh, good thing. Um, you know, obviously, we first and foremost create for ourselves. If you're creating for others and for the affirmation from others, uh, you're going to burn yourself out and you're going to hurt yourself. Uh, very quickly and very deeply. Um, so I would say first and foremost, you want to be shooting for yourself. Uh, but then when you get to the point like Eric's at where you want to actually reach out and get feedback from others, I do think that who you get feedback from is a very, very important thing. So I'd say the biggest thing is look and see who it is that you're uh, inspired by, who it is that you find to be influential within the sphere of uh, influence that you're trying to, to have with your photography, and then reach out to them, build a relationship with them, build a conversation with them, and, uh, and just ask them humbly, hey, do you think that you would be willing to critique some of my work? 
I'm going to move from the, the uh, thought process of feedback to the idea of critique because I, I think when we label it as so, uh, it becomes much more of a powerful thing. The big thing with critiques is you want to know what it is that you're trying to get uh, going into it. So um, if you're trying to get affirmation from someone, that's not a good thing to, to reach out. Asking someone for a critique uh, is important, but also giving them within bounds of what is it that you're hoping to get from the critique. Do you want to improve the, the strength of your individual images? Do you want to improve the strength of your images as a whole? Uh, your body of work? Do you want to know whether your body of work feels consistent or not? I would go into the relationship having some understanding of what it is that you're actually trying to improve within your artwork. They may come back to you with something completely outside of that that might also help you as well, but actually giving them some guidance. Anytime someone comes up to me and asks for a critique on their work, I always respond back first by going, what is it that you want critiqued on the work? What is it that you're actually looking to improve on? Or what do you feel like you're struggling with right now? So that way I have a better understanding of where to go with the critique. Um, someone giving you feedback based off of how they would have shot the photo different doesn't really help you out. It just gives you their thought process, but that doesn't allow you to be a standalone artist and create uh, you know, conceptual original work. So going into something and understanding uh, that you're looking to be challenged on concepts uh, within your work is a big, big thing. I would say find people that you find inspiring within your craft, but then also maybe on the fringe of your craft or outside your craft and start submitting your work to them to see. And then choose five to six images. Don't give them your entire portfolio. Choose five to six images and go, what do you think on these? And where do you think I'm lacking? Where do you think I'm strong in? And, and how do you think I can improve and take my work to the next level? Um, and then the big thing is when you reach out to those guys, understand that they might not be able to do it. If you don't have any relationship with them in the first place, you're asking for a big ask. And I would almost say even see how you can serve them and, and offer value to them before you even ask for uh, any kind of feedback or critique in the first place. Uh, and they'll be much more willing to do that. And then do I think that it's a, a valuable thing and how important is feedback or critique? Uh, I think it's a, extremely, extremely important. And uh, it's something that I like to submit myself to often. I do think that it's something that has helped me grow uh, quite a bit in my photography. And I, I think that it's something that everyone should be submitting themselves to. At the end of the day, though, you're creating for yourself. So if you reach out to one of these guys and you don't necessarily uh, agree, I would say consider what they have to say. But if you don't agree with some of the, the straightforward stuff that they're trying to call you out on, then you know by all means, continue down the avenue that you're going. But at the same time, uh, understand that you're reaching out for critique, not for affirmation. Um, so allow it to challenge your concepts and precepts. Uh, and I think it'll take your work to a different level. Mark Holmes says, if you could take a workshop with any photographer, I suppose dead or alive, who would it be? And also, if you could just grab lunch with any photographer, who would it be? Uh, I think this is a great, this is a very difficult question because there's a lot of photographers that I admire uh, and a lot of photographers that I would love to spend time with. As far as workshops, I would say uh, Jay Maisel. Um, Jay Maisel is one of my all-time favorite photographers. His his thought process has really been a, a giant like game changer for my street photography in the first place. All of his Calby One training videos and a ton of his interviews and stuff like that, his books um, have helped me in thinking about my work in a completely different way and approaching how I shoot in a completely different way. And I would love, love, love to do a workshop with him. So if he starts doing workshops anymore, I would actually consider jumping on and taking one. As far as just grabbing lunch with any photographer, that's, that's a good question. I'm the kind of guy who I, I enjoy grabbing lunch with anyone. Like I am a conversationalist. I love having engaging conversations and, and just diving into understanding and knowing people in general. Um, right now, a very surprising thing that I probably wouldn't have said in the past is I would love to have lunch with Bruce Gilden, uh, who is a photographer that I uh, am challenged by the way that he shoots because his, his shooting style and getting very abrasive with people is not necessarily how I would approach things. Um, and I kind of stiff arm that type of approach in my own work. Um, I do get up on people very close when I'm shooting street, but at the same time, um, my reaction and response to them is, is a little bit different. On the flip side, 
the way that he breaks down and talks about photography and the way that he talks about the work that he's creating is so, so, so interesting. And I would love to have just a conversation with him and, and just get to know him a little bit more in a, a personal instance to where, you know, I could kind of fill in some of the blanks to where I don't necessarily understand some of his work. There's a lot of work that I think is extremely powerful from him. And then there's a, a good portion of the work that I don't necessarily understand yet. But being able to get to know him a little bit more would be uh, probably a fun conversation, uh, especially because he's like a New Yorker of New Yorkers. Um, but I, I would say that that would be it. So a workshop, it'd be Jay Maisel, and uh, both are New Yorkers, surprisingly. Uh, maybe not surprisingly with how much I've been loving New York lately. And then for the lunch, it would be Bruce Gilden. I've just been loving interviews with him lately. If you don't, if you have never listened to any interviews with Bruce Gilden, go check them out because um, they're pretty incredible. Jahan from Do You Develop says, how strict are you with your photography? You mainly shoot with black and white film, occasionally uh, color, as you've mentioned. Under what circumstances will you break free from your standard approach towards work and venture into a field that isn't your usual approach? Vice versa, under what circumstances will you re refrain from shooting color? Um, this also goes for other things such as film format, etc. Um, Jahan, I think this is a, a very, very unique question. I even said to Jahan that this would probably bring out uh, some sort of rant. I think that the way that I'll explain it is probably contrary to how a lot of people understand who I am. Um, I'll, I'll start off by saying I really, really, really respect and, and uh, respond well to the self imposed limitations that I give myself. A big thing is I give myself the one camera and then the one film. I shoot HP5 at 1600. Those are the, the like constraints that I've given myself and then everything else within there, which is a large amount. I mean, that's taking, like we were talking about earlier, that, that middle portion out of the equation. Everything else is my thought process and the thing that's in front of my camera. And in that, I... I try to allow myself to move as freely as possible within there. I don't look at things of, this is what I shoot. I mean, obviously, there's things that I gravitate towards over and over and over again. Geometry and, and, and certain types of street photography. And we, even within that, there's chairs and, and hats and gesture and all these different triggers that I, I jump on and I continue to photograph because they continue to captivate me. But at the same time, I like going out empty. Uh, I don't, as best as I can, I don't go out with preconceived notions of what I'm going to shoot. When I went out to New York this last time, I actually ended up shooting with a 35 millimeter on my camera much more than the 50, whereas the last two times that I went out to New York, it was much more the 50. And it's just going, I want to go out and respond to whatever it is that I'm looking at. I put myself in a position, I'm going to go downtown to Grand Rapids, or I'm going to travel out to Chicago, or I'm going to travel out to New York. And anytime that I go out with preconceived notions of these are the things that I'm going to try and finish, um, I end up coming back discouraged because I, I didn't find that. Uh, obviously, as I've talked about it in the past, there's conversations that continue running through my head and will continue running through my head. And I like feeding those conversations. I like continuing those conversations. But I'm completely open to and I'm always looking for new conversations to happen. As far as like how strict are you with your photography, I've already set up the constraints within my photography. It's the one camera or, you know, if I shoot another camera, it will still probably be HP5 at 1600 because I, I like that constraint because within that constraint, it removes the gear out of the way and allows me to just be as free and as creative and as adventurous and as questioning and as whatever in the, the whole conversation of what's happening in front of me as possible. So as strict as I am with the, the gear and, and how I shoot, uh, I'm, I feel like, at least I, I like to think that, I'm as open as possible everywhere else. Yes, there's continued tropes. Yes, there's continued biases throughout my work, and there will continue to be. I, I still enjoy shooting chairs. I still enjoy shooting hats and street photography and all these different things, but I'm always open to being as creative and as open uh, to anything else. I, I don't see myself as a street photographer. I don't see myself as a geometric photographer. Uh, if all of a sudden I come into a place where I just want to run off and start doing portraits, that's what I'll do. It's whatever I'm responding to uh, in the first place, that's where my photography goes. I don't, I don't feel like I'm shoehorned into any particular thing. Um, and I think that that's the beauty of, of 
personal projects. I think that's the beauty of having conversations with the things that we're shooting is it could bring me in any different direction. And I love, love, love adventuring outside of things that I've known to be true. At the same time, uh, I also have shot a ton of different things. I mean, from 2010 to 2015, I was this adventurous photographer that shot landscape, that shot portraits, that shot automotive and HDR and all these different things that I shot. But uh, I, I realize that I do gravitate towards certain things. I love concert stuff. I love portraiture. I love weddings. I love all these different things. But it's really whatever is intriguing me at the time. If I feel like I'm I'm dead in a project at the moment, I'll shelf it. I'll jump over somewhere else. So uh, as strict as I am, I would say that I'm not strict at all. The, the striction comes from um, the gear limitations and then everything else from there flows in uh, however I'm responding to whatever it is in front of my camera. Thank you, Jahan. Thank you to everyone else who asked these questions. These were fantastic. We covered a ton of ground in this Q&A and uh, a couple things to, uh, to finish off the video. So first of all, if you're new to the channel, go check out some of the other videos. All sorts of great content, diving in deep to why we shoot, diving in deep to how to think about what we're shooting, how to build projects, how to sell our work, everything like that. Like and subscribe down below. Also a huge, huge, huge shout out to our patrons over at patreon.com slash Nick Exposed. We just hit the $200 mark and uh, I want to give a special, special thank you to all of our executive producers who are going above and beyond to really make sure that this channel is able to move forward in all sorts of different directions and do all sorts of new things. So thank you guys for your support. I really do appreciate it. We're having great conversations over there on Patreon. I've been using it as kind of a blog to share some late night thoughts and middle of the day thoughts. And I, as soon as I get a thought, I just kind of jot it down and send it out to the patron crowd. So thank you guys. I hope you guys are enjoying that over there. And uh, I hope everyone else would consider checking that out and helping to support the channel and take it to all sorts of new areas. So uh, we got tons of videos coming up this week and in the weeks moving forward, it's summertime right now. So I think we're going to start cranking out videos left and right. But thank you guys. I love you guys. Uh, and if you have any other questions that didn't make it into the video, ask those down below. Leave your thoughts on the questions that were asked down below. I look forward to reading through those and having conversations with you down there and seeing you in the next video. Until then, go and push yourselves two stops. Peace.